It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you um, our speaker today, Carla Ertz, from the University College of London for the Institute of Education. Uh, she's going to give us our second webinar in uh, her three-part series, where we had the first one uh, on learning context in uh, January. Uh, later in the session, we will share uh, the link to the recording of that, which is already on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, this session is called Learning and Teaching in a Technology-Driven World. Um, and uh, Carla, uh, you're welcome to start your session. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you and to be able to um, talk to you. I hope you can all hear me and that there's not too much of an echo. Um, and um, yes, uh, one thing I wanted to say before I really start, which is a little bit of an apology. I'm a Northern Hemisphere person. And I'm a Northern Hemisphere person working mainly in Northern Hemisphere contexts. So whilst I um, sort of um, have had exposure to Southern Hemisphere and developing world context, and I still kind of keep myself very immersed in those when I can, some of my perspectives may not really chime that easily with you. Um, but I hope you can bear with me because that's also a little bit part of the uh, objective here is and I'll hopefully we'll get to that a bit later but uh, I just wanted to kind of uh, contextualize this a little bit because there's nothing as contextual as contextual of course as education which is what we kind of saw uh, for those of you who were in the last session what the last session kind of focused on and this is kind of continuing that uh, to some extent, but it's also going a little bit more generic. So I hope you can bear with me, and um, I will kick off now. Uh, because what I would like to start talking about is more about, actually, you know, there's so many claims in, in the technology space about how technology is going to rescue education, make it so much better, improve education, and with a bit of hubris, which is not kind of strange to the technology world, we will solve yet another problem. Problem is, it's not a single problem. And the problem is, quite often, the solutions proposed on solving it may even be exacerbating the problem that they have perceived. So that's kind of a little bit more of the slant to this uh, session, which is also more about raising some questions which I don't necessarily also have the answers to, but that I hope will continue into, um, you know, a nice debate and a nice discussion, and you know, maybe continued engagement on the um, on the uh, Adobe Net uh, side. So here I go. Um, right. Um, so we know that learning and teaching is meant to have changed considerably, that there was a then, that there was a now, but actually we also know that the now is still very much about the then, and that in some cases the then hasn't really evolved at all. We still use a lot of class, front of class scenarios. We still have kind of a disparity in access to um, resources, technology, infrastructure. So and the models, more to the point, that are entry model of education where it was a kind of mass market delivery style of mode where you kind of look at bringing a bunch of learners together of a certain age and put them in a classroom or a lecture theater and pretty much deliver the same kind of content or learning to all of them. So that was what hap was happening then. This is still what is happening now. However, here and there, obviously, there's lots of dialogue and discussion around new teaching modes, new learning modes, um, flipping the classroom, personalizing learning, making sure that learners get learning journeys that are adaptive and, and suited to their learning styles. By the way, learning styles is a concept that is really not entirely sound, but I don't really want to go into that in this lecture. Um, and that, you know, sort of the, this will kind of change and radicalize education for the 21st century. All good and well, but it 
it ain't quite happening because we're still kind of resort, resorting to our old models of pedagogy, our old models of you know educational values, and sort of into which we kind of starting to retrofit the technology. So if I then move on, in terms of the change, and in, in terms of the change in the classroom or the lecture theatre, you know what is the teacher? Is the te and what is a tutor? What is are we really looking at scenarios where we kind of considering teaching more of a mentoring um, position than you know a front of class instructional kind of role? And you know if you're looking at some of the technology claims, are we actually needing to move to teachers becoming uh, you know teaching being undertaken by robots? And is that really where we where education should move? Some technologists may argue that actually t robots can replace teachers quite nicely. Of course, none of us will corroborate that. None of us will endorse that. None of us will uh, subscribe to that. What we might want to subscribe to, of course, is are there means of technology that actually can augment the teaching and the level of mentoring and the level of instruction, and more to the point, the level of attainment in the learner. So, what I'm sort of trying to kind of get at, and what I'm increasingly kind of getting concerned about or struggling with myself, it's probably more appropriate to describe it as a struggle or a bit of a questioning in myself, is actually increasingly I'm seeing sort of a huge technology tension um, occurring between the technology and the actual education. And the kind of the lack of dialogue between the technology players and the education list is probably uh, exacerbating this issue. Um, whilst it's all very good to throw a lot of technology at learners and teachers and institutions, and you know we can't deny it's it's ubiquitous. There is actually quite a bit of a disparity between how this technology is kind of entering and being adopted in the education space. For a start, education is probably one of the latest, if not the latest, adopter of technology at scale or technology at um, sort of at systemic level, because it's so hard, because it's so contextual, because it po it's politics, because it's kind of also working in a tradition of providing a stability, which the technology could easily kind of disrupt to a level that becomes very, very uncomfortable and very uncontrolled. However, this is a tension that we're dealing with when we're dealing with uh, technology. So, like I said already, you know, I'm sort of um, increasingly asking more questions than finding answers, because I, I also believe that the way technology is evolving and the way that technology is being adopted in the world necessitates us, not just in education, but throughout, to start asking those questions increasingly. You know, we all know that, you know, the concerns about artificial intelligence and the automation and the potential threat to the jobs and, um, you know, how, how data are being gathered exponentially. You know, in the UK, there's even been, you know, a bit of a scandal uh, about one of the NHS National Health Service hospitals selling anonymized patient data to DeepMind, which is a Google company. Um, so quite a few boundaries are starting to kind of be crossed, and maybe not necessarily crossed very ethically. Um, and you know, this is also starting to be the case in certain education um, landscapes or territories or, you know, where, um, or institutions where that kind of boundary with the adoption of technology and ethical frameworks hasn't really uh, been established because nobody really knows how to deal with it. So whilst the technology is obviously making an entrance and has been making an entrance in education for some time, there's also something that's quite um, typical about education for the reasons and some of the reasons I outlined before, in as much that, you know, the world around education is changing very fast. 
uh, certainly on the technology side, on the job side, on the economic side, on um, you know kind of displacement, uh, refugee, um, the whole kind of landscape around education is really, really changing exponentially fast. Yet, of course, education isn't really changing that much. Um, learning and teaching behaviors aren't necessarily changing that much. Yet, young learners, kind of, you know, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, are drowning in technology. Yet, when they come to school, suddenly it seems that they can't use the technology that's being put in front of them in the classroom because it's completely alien to the technology they use outside of school. Um, so that already also causes a rift between what's in the school or in the institution, what is in the outside world for especially the younger learners. Um, and also illustrates that you know, there is that kind of tension between what's going on outside and what's going on inside the education institutions, and then not really being ready or able to kind of embrace or, you know, kind of transform uh, themselves to the extent or the speed, rather, that uh, the transformation is happening outside. So, and this is quite often something that the technology players, I think, tend to ignore because their focus lies somewhere different. And because, you know, ultimately, they're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to solve what they perceive to be a problem, or they try to introduce um, an improvement, or they're trying to enhance, you know, as outcomes. Um, and that's where I sort of just wanted to highlight one of the struggles I've also got is that, um, you know, promise of technology is absolutely fantastic. And please don't get me wrong, I still totally believe in technology being um, a catalyst in access to education, especially in the Southern Hemisphere and in, in developing world where, you know, other means may not be available. So I'm a great believer in technology and education. And I really, you know, want to kind of make sure that that is understood, that I'm not sitting here trying to kind of um, criticize any adoption of technology or technology per se in the education and the learning space. No, no, I'm actually advocating the adoption. I'm just highlighting that I'm increasingly seeing quite complex tensions and frictions that I myself am finding quite hard to um, um, resolve. Um, so, okay, I can see that some questions are being posted. Just a question from me to the group. Would you like me to go into the questions that are already being posted now, or would you rather I continue my presentation? Carla, I think um, I would encourage you to uh, continue your presentations. Um, I know Tony and myself okay. we will be uh, just keep an eye on the on the, on the text okay. and then perhaps better that we. Uh, towards the end, um, just gather some of yep. those questions and then uh, uh, pass them okay. on to you. Okay, no, absolutely fine. Yep, that's absolutely fine. So um, I was kind of coming to this kind of promise of technology, which I've highlighted quite a few times. And this is where I sort of um, feel that the promise hasn't quite delivered, which I, I'm hoping to kind of clarify a little bit more later on. So we all know, you know, the promise of technology in, in education quite often has been also pushed by the publishers because the educational publishers also have problems in terms of, you know, the kind of whole publishing world being totally transformed and disrupted and technology being often seen as a, a way to kind of solve that problem, um, which has given them other problems. Um, in terms of that, you know, we know that Pearson, for instance, hasn't been doing very well because technology strategy that they um, embraced didn't really work. Now, why was that? And and how how what's what's kind of part of the fundamental problem in in those kind of strategies for me and the kind of drive for ed education technology adoption is that I believe that um, 
a lot of technologies claim they can improve learning outcomes without even having any shred of evidence that this is the case. The kind of technology, education technology market and the, the sort of the stakeholders quite often in that market quite often believe that, you know, this at face value without ne necessarily really kind of um, questioning that or even looking for the evidence. And even agreeing on a definition of what learning outcomes really mean uh, because they can mean so many different things. And that for me is, is kind of one of the, the big questions around, you know, sort of, oh, let's adopt technology because we can improve learning outcomes. It is also something that's very often being sold to kind of ministries of education, especially in kind of developing and emerging economies where technology players have gone in, you know, if you adopt technology, if you put hardware in the classroom, I don't need to tell you the scenario. You know it far better than I do. You know, um, developing world countries are riddled with hardware that's never been deployed because nobody knows how to deploy it. Yet the claim was we will deliver learning outcomes. Actually, what's happened is, you know, the learning outcome has not even been addressed. Um, so that's one kind of, um, you know, angle to the learning outcomes being sort of a focal point to the technology players, the content players, and of course the policy makers. Because what do policy makers really need? Um, they love to see, you know, targets. They love to love to be able to kind of show measuring uh, because it may look good for their next election or for their next political campaign. And it kind of helps them, in a way, address the education problem potentially more superficially than perhaps they should be doing because they're looking at the stats and they're looking at, you know, the kind of the data that say, oh, okay, uh, we've introduced a, a new um, mathematics course that is online and we're seeing that our learning outcomes have improved by 83%. Um, how can you make that claim? What are you comparing it against? Were you measuring and using the same measurements before you were implementing this mathematics course online? How, how has that been kind of defined? Those definitions, you know, if you really start looking at them, or even those data sets, are often so loosely defined, yet used as, as kind of corroboration for, you know, measuring and evidencing of outcomes because they look good, but they don't tell us anything. And that's kind of where I sort of feel that, you know, again, you know, technology should do this better. Technology should work much more closely with the educational, um, the educationists, the stakeholders, the teachers, the learners, to really work out what a sensible stack of data analysis uh, around this means. And bring us a level of a measurement to this that is also helping the teachers not or the tutors not putting it in their way because it's too complex it's too kind of superficial it it uh, brings in a threshold rather than an, an interface that they can deal with and that they can kind of actually interpret and even to a large extent can customize themselves to kind of find out what is important to them to measure rather than have a set of metrics that quite often are not necessarily that meaningful. Yet that is what the technology so often kind of drives because, you know, we've got the data, we've got the tools to measure, we can give you the data on the fly, we can do this all dynamically, you've got it all in front of you without any problem. Again, the other thing with that is also what has that been based on and how has that, you know, kind of process been derived? Um, I sort of think it's really time for um, a timeout and, you know, our cup of tea to kind of ponder over this a little bit um, in more detail and also to kind of consider that a little bit more. What I'm not suggesting is that we kind of say, okay, let's stop the, the technology introduction into education now, let's have a think and let's continue. It doesn't work that way, nor would it, we want it to work that way because we'd never learn anything. The whole thing about it is let's introduce it, let's do it in small steps, let's kind of learn from it, but also let's be sensible about it and let's kind of think about 
hey, if we are looking at new kind of education modes and looking at what the world needs in a fast evolving 21st century with new skill sets uh, required that nobody really understands um, what they might be, um, which has always been a little bit the case, but of course now it's so much more exponential and fast. Um, there has to be a transformative element to bringing that technology into education. And I think, for me, that is one of the things where it has gone a bit wrong in education. When I look at you know, where technology has been introduced successfully and, and where it's kind of become part of business as usual and kind of become widely adopted, sometimes slower, sometimes faster, it's exactly because the technology has enabled or has had a transformative um, impact, even if we're not aware of it, even if it's kind of um, unconscious. Look at how we use smartphones. I mean, how much more transformational can you be? And when I look at, for instance, my colleagues in the medical department, you know, they're kind of, okay, Medicine has always had technology, but if I'm looking at the kind of learning technologies and, and sort of the transformational technologies that medicine is now adopting, that's pretty, pretty transformative. And that's the ones that are chucked out are the ones that aren't successful for either scientific reasons or they're not sustaining or helping that transformation that the, the discipline needs. Um, to you know, deliver effective and 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 good healthcare. Um, I haven't seen that in education. I haven't seen that transformation. I haven't seen you know the kind of impact of technology being transformative in education. Why is that? Well, yeah, we said it earlier. Education is fast, is slow moving, is very established. Is you know uh, would need a quite quite a systemic shake up to um kind of create that transformation but i think there's also another reason for this um and um i kind of call it the, the static nature of change in education because there is a lot of kind of you know pull pull back or push back rather in kind of adoption in education you know people and and you know the teaching profes profession gets anxious about wow, we have to do something new, we have to kind of look at a new process, we have to kind of look at something that we haven't done before. Um, that is alien to us because we've kind of worked out how we want to deliver pedagogy, dependent on the type of pedagogy or type of learning or education your respective institutions or countries are and, and their models that they're kind of adopting. But you know, this has been a kind of static profession for quite a long time um, and hasn't necessarily had to deal with a lot of change on a day-to-day -day basis. Yet, you know, what's happened uh, with the technology? I look at a lot of learning platforms where I kind of look at, you know, I'm an end user of this platform. How the heck do you want me to engage with this platform? I, I really can't see this being a user-centric or a learner or a teacher-centric solution because most of it, and certainly the first generation platforms and technologies, were all called learning management systems or virtual learning environments. Yet the focus was really on the management of that learning, not necessarily on the value or the, um, or the kind of... Um, delivery of that learning or the adoption of that learning. It was about the management of that learning. And what I feel has happened is that to some extent the technology has done a retrofit, especially in these early generation technologies that have created so many hurdles for so many people in, in terms of adoption and transformation. Because the way they were uh, conceived was, you know, people looked at, okay, what is the process that underpins, you know, uh, a teaching trajectory. Um, um, what are the, not even the learning trajectory, the teaching trajectory, because you know you've got to manage that learning. And then what's been happening is that you know a kind of process analysis of that 
trajectory or that workflow has been done, which has then been translated into a systems analysis and a systems architecture and development that has retrofitted that technology into this process rather than helping this process to transform. So most of those early generation and still quite a lot of the current generation's platforms have done that retrofit. And if you do a retrofit, you can't be transformative because you're retrofitting it. What you're trying to aspire to is actually, yes, you claim to be transformative because it's technology, but you're not really changing anything except the only change that I find with most of these platforms, if not all of them, is that the change has kind of been having a negative impact rather than a positive impact and has reinforced the way in which and reinforced and actually um, put more of a straight jacket around the process and leaving less control to the teachers and the learners on how they are dealing with their education uh, workflows or their learning workflows. So that for me is a, a, a really big problem that I've, I see in kind of education technology and that's where I think the southern hemisphere has got a one-up because you can kind of define how you can do this much better, how you can, you know, make it more transformative, um, also much more contextualized. And, and I still strongly believe that that innovation in, in that kind of technology and also the, world, the way technology might kind of influence education and, and, and learning is for a, to a huge extent going to come from the Southern Hemisphere. And I really encourage you all to kind of think about this because I think the Northern Hemisphere on this front really needs your help. Um, so, and yes, Tony, all platforms uh, frustrate me to a large extent. Um, so moving on then, you know, kind of the retrofit. Yeah, well, if you retrofit, things kind of start not working very well after a while. They go rusty, they um, start falling apart, and you can't quite you know, get the right tools for the right job. So the other uh, second aspect of it, I think, is very much to do with the lack of looking at digital and, you know, I, I, I don't even want to call it ICT, but looking at actually the adoption of um, technology and things we use in the world today into the classroom but actually embedded in teacher education. I see so little evidence and I have to admit even at my own institutions, although we have got a technology on, I see so little evidence of kind of embedding that digital literacy, digital awareness, um, you know, the kind of engagement with the digital space in my teaching profession in the classroom as part of my teacher education. And I think that is a second big problem that education potentially face, faces with this technology adoption. A, it's been retrofitted. It's quite often the retrofit has made it very, very hard. But fundamentally, most teacher education does not address the fact that we live in a digital or in an increasingly digital world and what that means in terms of teaching, in terms of learning, in terms of, you know, dealing with kind of um, digital good practice, digital ethics, digital literacy, all these issues, they don't seem to be adopted in, in, in teacher education at the scale and to the extent that they really need to be adopted. I don't even want to start discussing kind of the need for new pedagogies in this context because that's completely probably a topic for another another session. But this is for me, you know, again an, an issue that I find, you know, and that causes that friction with technology in education. So that's kind of um, I've been talking about quite a lot of different things um, to you for quite a long time nonstop. Um, and maybe have bombarded you a little bit with all of this. Um, but these are kind of the, the things that I sort of wanted to, um, to kind of raise today in terms of like 
is it really a question of adapting or is it also a question that goes beyond adapting that because adapting again kind of starts looking at oh we've got something that we need to adapt to that's not necessarily something that's going to help us transform what we do and how we do it and how we can improve it so these were kind of some of the predictions that I kind of have to admit I can't grab, grapple with myself um, I don't always find good answers for it, but that I wanted to share with you, not as a frustration, but also very much as an opportunity, because that's ultimately what we're looking at here. Um, you know, we we can make it better. We can uh, do things differently. Uh, it's a question of kind of starting that trajectory in small steps. Um, so I hope this kind of um, has, you know, proved of some interest. Um, I've enjoyed very much kind of putting this little session together, um, but I also hope that I haven't confused you more uh, than sort of giving you some, some pointers that you find beneficial. So thank you all very much for bearing with me. Would anybody like to start quest ask, asking questions? Or Tony, is it over to you now? Sure. Um, thank you very much, Carla. You have bombarded us, but it's been a very good bombardment. I've been harvesting okay. the questions, and I'll one by one copy them back into the text chat um, to yep. bring them to your attention. Um, the okay. first question comes from Olafemi, who was asking, can you recall when learning technologies were first received in your school or university? and some of the reactions from academics and also an extension have those reactions changed over time okay this is actually a really good question because I have to kind of admit to something here um, I don't know how much you know about UCL um, UCL historically is a bit of an amalgamation of uh, colleges that have come together um, and it started very much from a kind of medical perspective um, and for instance, the Institute of Education, which I uh, belong to, has only been, become part of, the, of UCL two years ago. So within the kind of UCL context, because there is this kind of fragmentation, if you like, of, of colleges with all their kind of historical background and legacy, there is currently no kind of one strategy for the whole university around online learning. It's one of the projects I'm working on, by the way. But there isn't an overall strategy uh, around online learning. Now, the Institute of Education, partly because of its nature and, and, and engaging, you know, we have a, um, a huge department around international development and education. So a lot of us, and, and a lot of our students are from abroad, has actually been a really very early adopter of, of kind of distance learning technologies. However crude or however, um, you know, sort of um, tricky they were, the Institute adopted them. This has given us a kind of, in a way, another problem in as much that we're still adopting all these early technologies which aren't necessarily giving students a lot of learning satisfaction but give us an ability to kind of at least transmit our teaching to those students. Not, I wouldn't call it interactive because often it isn't interactive at all. So from that perspective, I think UCL is, is kind of behind the curve. And there is, if I kind of then take that conversation to looking at it from, you know, the kind of academics perspective, it's a very mixed, mixed perspective because there are a bunch of academics who are already doing it. We've kind of have sort of nurtured a bit of a cottage industry. So you've got like one guy in perioperative medicine who's doing something quite amazing with, with actually very little. But it sort of works. But he's kind of gone his own way. He said, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this under the radar, and, and it sort of works. Whereas, um, you know, kind of university-wide, initially the technologies were also very much adopted to, because we're still very, well, we're still very much a face-to-face -face university, certainly UCL is. IOE has got that kind of distance element much more than the other faculties. Um, so um, the kind of... Um, Focus on technology at UCL has been very much come has very much come from the IT perspective, which is how it always starts. But that doesn't necessarily lend itself very well to kind of making that transformation to 
an online perspective. I'm not even talking about just a distance provision. I'm talking about a really online, um, structured, you know, well-structured pedagogical model and interactive model for online learning delivery suited to an online context. So we're working on this now. We're kind of coming up with uh, some strategic recommendations for the senior management to consider as a kind of institution-wide, uh, rather than continuing with our, may I call it, haphazard approach of, of, of um, you know, faculty by faculty doing their own things, uh, because, you know, there wasn't a central uh, kind of uh, strategic drive to do this, and also because of the legacy of the university coming together uh, historically through, you know, kind of colleges and institutes joining the university rather than kind of uh, starting as a single kind of entity from the start. So it's a bit of a, a, a bit of a complex picture at, at uh, UCL. Whereas, for instance, if you look at King's College in London, they're making much more inroads, step by step. But, you know, they've, they've um, got a part, partnership with Arizona State. They're working with, you know, they work on through a kind of an alliance to kind of deliver their, their online provision. Um, and that's starting to grow. Um, Exeter University has just embarked on a fairly uh, aggressive uh, trajectory. Um, and what is also very interesting, because the universities that have just been quoted are all part of what we call the Russell Group, um, you see actually much more transformation and innovation coming from the kind of the second tier, like, uh, for instance, Coventry um, and um, those kind of universities, because they really are trying to kind of ex uh, expand their international um, presence and engagement. And they're really using online um, uh, mechanisms for growth. So whereas the Russell Group has, because of its kind of prestige, and may I also say at times self-indulgence, has kind of rested on its laurels a little bit in terms of making technology um, a core strategic consideration. But it's starting to re reflect negatively on kind of, you know, student surveys and things because, you know, those students who are coming through now, they're expecting more technology. They're expecting more ability to, you know, kind of work in, in modern environments. And, um, you know, the survey has kind of described in some cases as some of our facilities being a uh, developing world. And, you know, um, I think I said this morning, I've, I've seen better facilities in the developing world than I've seen at UCL. So um, we've got some work to do. I think is what I would say. And the mindset definitely has a lot of work to do. And we are looking at a bunch of early adopters who can sort of start cascading that process. Because you never do it all at once. You have to kind of move in little steps. Thank you, Carla. Interesting to see how one sentence question can open up that much complexity. Yes. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm thanks sorry. Sort of for that one. Um, okay, and the follow-up question from Pauline, which related to the reactions from um, students, particularly adult students, and I suspect you've yeah. re already covered most of that one. Um, okay. Yep, is there anything else you need to say about that? Uh, hang on a minute, I'm trying to find a question now. Right at the end. Okay, sorry, I was... Uh, um, Okay, I think I may have had it, um, actually answered some of them um, in terms of, you know, the on-campus, uh, especially the undergraduate students are asking for more technology, asking for more modern ways of engaging with learning. Um, the, our distance students, it's a bit of a mixed bunch because most of our distance provision at the IOE um, and actually across universities done at PGT level. So we, we wouldn't at this moment in time even consider it at undergrad. Um, so um, what you know, is useful for in that context of courses and which is also the reason why we're doing it is um, a lot of our kind of students um, are professionals and in the field and work and have families and, and you know, can't necessarily come to London them because it's too expensive and all those kind of things. So on the whole, they kind of receive the fact that they can engage with us at distance really, really well. 
what we are kind of starting to see though is that they want this kind of engagement to sort of become a bit more modern um, and a bit more engaging and a bit more supportive because that's another thing in, in terms of you know if you start kind of doing this online provision you really need to kind of have a different um, look at uh, on how you kind of support your students and your learners and what that support really means both academically and you know in terms of classical support and you're starting to look at much more of an engagement strategy to kind of inform that support as well because what you don't want to see is that because the kind of online attrition rate can be really really high you have kind of have to work on how you keep your students engaged with you now the fact that we're doing pgt at the ioe and that people who do come to the ioe usually are very motivated our attrition rate on that front is quite low but you know we're definitely getting requests for improvement and you know that's the thing you you have to continue evolving in this space thanks Carla um, yeah I noticed your slide about the tea break and yeah. in relation to that I wanted to ask a question with a little bit of provocation um, do you think Please, with do. the current <laughs> challenges we'd be better off spending less money on tech solutions because mostly they don't work um, I think um, the problem with the tech solutions as they are in education now is that they tend to cost a lot of money and that the way they've kind of been implemented and, and kind of developed quite often work on models where you sort of um, have to do the whole hog. You know, there's no, no way to kind of iterate or kind of have a, an agility model or work even with a minimum viable product because that's not how education works. However, I think if, if we are looking at making technology more uh, available, accessible and affordable to education, we will need to look at how we can kind of adopt this in, in sort of more incremental ways rather than sort of saying, okay, we're going to have one platform and one solution for all of this. Um, we don't use our computers like that either. You know, we use tools for work, we use tools for you know, spreadsheets, we use tools for email, we use, tool, we use a, a plethora of different tools. And I think, in a way, that's also how we need to start looking at the technologies, is actually, rather than cramming it all into one big platform, which doesn't really help, um, you know, or support uh, the learning and the teaching very well, is actually what tools do we use for, for what purpose? And should we start looking at developing educational tools and learning tools in that context and actually paying more attention to APIs, um, 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 so the application interfaces that allow applications to talk to each other rather than trying to build a massive solution that does everything. And I think that's where the retrofit comes in again versus the transformative. Um, Doing that is, is really difficult. I, I'm, I'm not trying to shy away from that. It's incredibly hard um, because, of course, you kind of um, have to work with potentially smaller groups to get it off the ground, which you know would be actually a better model anyway. But in terms of kind of getting that trajectory established, it may appear as a far slower win than you know uh, putting in. This is the platform we're going to use, and we're going to put all our resources in it, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and uh, we'll have all the learners' reports in it, and you know, we just can sort of believe we can click one button and have all the answers. It kind of doesn't work that way. Okay, um, and then there was a question that came through from Yusuf. Um, who was saying, would you say universities, specifically in South Africa, don't take into account the needs of students when implementing e-learning technology? And obviously your experience is not in South Africa, um, but it seems like you're, gen you're saying at a more generic level that that's what you see happening. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. I don't want to kind of be specific because I can't be, but at a generic level, this is what I see happen. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, to sort of um, give you a, a bit of an example of, of um, what is meant to be a very high-ranking American university, Columbia, I was at a conference with one of their uh, their vice provost education, I think he was, 
uh, who's talking about you know their adoption of, of uh, e-learning and, and technology at the university and I was completely um, thrown by him because I thought he would come in and be you know he'd been very sophisticated and be doing all these things and effectively what he was saying is um, you know we kind of using a, a platform like Moodle um, it might even have been Moodle I think they used Blackboard I can't quite remember but that's effectively what he was saying but um, what what didn't occur or didn't transpire from his presentation was that actually this was really a positive uh, influence on the university. He, you know, uh, his kind of statement was, we are embracing technology, we're using a learning platform, and that's what Columbia is doing, which I was completely um, struck by because I'm sure some of his peers in kind of different disciplines might sort of not quite agree with that statement. But it was quite indicative that, you know, it was again hinging around that, that single learning platform, um, which, you know, I, I think it's, it's obviously where most universities are and uh, where that leaves little um, room for transformation. Yep, um, the retrofit theme keeps um, coming up. Um, a question from Marietta. Are you suggesting the scenario where students bring their own devices and that education should use technologies that students are familiar with, for example, Facebook and WhatsApp? Um, I'm not an advocate of using Facebook and WhatsApp for education. I'm not adverse to using, say, uh, an app like WhatsApp to communicate with students about you know, tutorials or something. It wouldn't be my preferred option. But I, I think we really have to be careful to start looking at those kind of players and bring it into the education space. Um, and also, you know, the kind of the way that social media models work, they're not really uh, pedagogical models, they're not really learning models, they're not, you know, um, they may complement things, but I, I, I'm certainly not an advocate of, of using those kind of um, solutions in, in education. What I, I would want to kind of see is actually what can we learn from kind of user behavior and user adoption in those kind of um, platforms and applications and, 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 and um, um, collaborative um, tools that we can bring into education, into the education space that actually will bring that kind of um, value and, and, and ability to kind of inject this new way of, of, of bringing technology into education. But I, for a start, I would, I would have a real problem with Mark Zuckerberg uh, starting to get involved in, in learning. He's tried it in Africa and he really failed. And, and um, you know, it's, it's um, you know, would we want all our learner data and all our learning to happen on these kind of big commercial platforms that, you know, only make certain people richer and maybe the rest of us poorer? I, I really don't think so. And more to the point, I don't think they're, you know, the best pedagogically sound tools to use. But we should learn from them, and we should instill education with some of that kind of thinking and, and in terms of how to kind of solve certain problems and how to be very um, agile about it as well. Um, so, yeah. Thank you for sharing that skepticism, which I think many people in the education field share with you. Um, Olufemi said something interesting about technology choice. Today, with so many technologies with overlapping roles, it's frustrating making a choice. And perhaps the implication of that is um, that institutions try to simplify their choices by choosing yeah. bundles of technologies which they can buy from one provider because yeah. it's just so complicated. Yes, and I, I mean, absolutely, it is hellishly complicated. Um, and, um, you know, if, if as an institution you want to at least have an overview of what, what you're kind of uh, dealing with, then that's the kind of the, the route you tend to, to take. And I can kind of see why you do that because, you know, how do you do it differently? However, it, it, it actually doesn't really give a lot of space to, um, you know, variety in, in disciplines and variety of, 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 um, of actually user control as well. 
you know, whilst, whilst you want to kind of endorse and, and adopt and, and instill kind of standards and, and you know, um, ways of doing things that are quite uniform in a way, uh, because also that helps your user experience anyway, I think with kind of just throwing a, a stack of technology at people to adopt institution-wide without leaving the room to, for people to kind of go, you know what, I actually use this tool and I use it quite a lot and it does a very specific thing but I really like it and my students like it, why can't I use it? You know, and, and it, it is really hard because making the choices is incredibly difficult because by the time it's like buying a car, by the time you drive it out of the garage, your, your car isn't worth anything anymore. And with the technology, it's kind of, you, you kind of make a decision around a technology solution and quite often, you know, it, it changes really, really fast. Um, and that is a, a really, really big problem, which is also more of an argument, I, I think, is that we shouldn't necessarily invest in huge, big, single platforms, but more an amalgamation of technologies, so you can actually, uh, as technology and, and the world evolves, you can also opt to introduce a new small or a new smaller piece of technology that actually is then more fit for purpose or more applicable to what you're doing. Um, but again, that relies on, on looking at or thinking uh, uh, around the kind of API space much more than universities and institutions currently do. Um, and and that's, a, that's a kind of a complete mind shift and a complete kind of IT transformation from looking beyond IT and looking at kind of, you know, we live in a digital world and we live in a digital learning world. And to do that well, we need to make sure that we can kind of stay relevant. And that means probably looking at different approaches to using technology. I'm considered a heretic on this, by the way, at uh, UCL. Uh, my colleagues don't agree with that at all. So, um, um, but I, 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 I think, you know, buying the monolith and investing so much uh, into the monolith, and if you look at the number of people it takes to support the monolith, um, that's actually quite a risky strategy as well. Carla, thank you. It's very good to have um, you know input from heretics in this field. Um, we need more. Um, there's a question here from Frank. Are there any studies that have provided insight into learner and context analysis? in the instructional design process of any e-learning project. Are there any particular models that you would um, recommend that address that issue, Carla? I think there are, I'm, I'm, I need to kind of refer a little bit to some of my colleagues because from my perspective and because I don't work as much in, in the research, well I don't really work in the research space, I'm more on the kind of um, the innovation space. Um, I know that some work has been done. I've seen some studies that sort of touch on it, but I haven't really myself found the study that really, really does that. I think one of the problems is, for, for a lot, and certainly, you know, if I can sort of look at the institution I'm in, for instance, if I look at the people who work in, in our technology space of education, there aren't really many currently at the Institute, if any, who actually work very much beyond the UK context. And that already gives, gives you a bit of a skewed, a, skewed, um, um, a skewed picture. So um, that is a bit of a problem. Um, what I can do though, because um, it's a really good question and I've been trying to get to some of these studies myself, I will actually fire it off to um, a couple of new people who are joining the institute who are much more involved with that kind of um, the learner and context analysis um, than some of my current colleagues. So if you can bear with me and I can send it then to Jakob or, or Tony, um, I, I will definitely follow up on that one. Um, thanks, Carla. We can also continue the conversation in our Facebook group. We're getting very yeah. close to the scheduled end time of the session. Yeah. So I'd like to ask everybody here, um, even if you haven't said a single word in the text chat, um, if you have any thoughts about your takeaways 
from this webinar, if you can enter even a few words or phrases about what you're taking away from the webinar into the text chat, um, and we'll keep the text chat open for a couple of minutes after we close the um, recording as well. But in the meanwhile, I'd really like to thank you, Carla, for sharing so deeply from your insights, experience, um, and your skepticism and awareness of all the things that can go wrong and have gone wrong in this educational technology space. Um, it's good to have this combination of skepticism and persistence and ingenuity that you communicate. Well, it's, as always, Tony, it's an absolute pleasure and honor to do this. So um, the pleasure's been all mine. So um, I hope it was um, fruitful and um, you know, I hope we can continue the conversation. I may not be able to engage very much uh, this afternoon, but I'll certainly sort of we'll pick up the thread and I will follow up on, on some of these studies because it's, uh, there are things that I've been looking for myself um, and um, it's, it's a good prompt to keep looking. And I also want to re-emphasize that, you know, there's a vast opportunity out there and we should really think very hard about it. Um, and I'm, you know, it's a privilege to be part of that thinking. So, thank you. Thank you, Carla, and thank you to everybody who joined us for your reflections, insights, questions, and your feedback now. Um, I'm noticing feedback coming through from Lisa, Frank, Marietta, and several other people currently entering their feedback and their takeaways from the session. Hoping to see you um, continue the conversation in the Facebook group and also at other upcoming events organized by Emerge Africa. Thanks all. Um, we're going to close the recording now. The recording is now off.